Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored to be here. Donna Leone is the author of the international best-selling Commissario Brunetti mystery novels, the beloved series of books starring the cultured, shrewd, and erudite detective that debuted more than 30 years ago. Her work has won her millions of admirers the world over and a raft of prizes, including the CWA McAllen Silver Dagger for Fiction. She joins us today with the 31st installment in the series. Thank you so much for being here, Donna. The screen is all yours. Thank you. The pleasure is mine to be here. Um, I'd like to speak a bit about the, can I use the word Genesis? The genesis of this book, that means where I got the idea. I have a, uh, a friend who works in another city, and I've known him a long time, and I know him to be a good person, a, a good and honest person. And he was working for a charity, what the Italians call an onlus, which means organizzazione non lucrativa, the utilità sociale, which means an organization which doesn't make any money and whose goal is social usefulness, which these organizations are meant to be. And he said, I can't stand it anymore. The place is not an honest place and I'm an honest person, so I, I can't work there anymore. And so he quit in the middle of uh, an unemployment at the stars in, in Italy, he decided that for the, his sake of honor, he, had, he couldn't continue working for this organization and so he quit. And he is now sort of unemployed but has some odd jobs as a fundraiser. And I thought, how would that be as an idea for a book where an organization, the purpose of which is to do good, is really just a way for people to to make money for themselves rather than for the, the, um, the poor people they are supposedly helping. And so I started reading a lot about this problem because once I got the idea in my head, I started noticing the articles in the papers, in the Italian papers about similar things. And so I organized a, a charity which was, which needed examination, which needed examination, but I needed a way for the book to start. Usually when I, when I start a book, what I need is an idea like the, the crooked charity, but I need a way for Brunetti to get into the business of pursuing that subject, whatever the subject is. He's a policeman, so he has authority, but someone has to call the cops to say, to blow the whistle on whoever or whatever is going on. And I didn't want it to have it be a phone call that came to the Questura and he said, oh, I'll take the case. And so what I did was work on the presupposition of Brunetti's charity of his, his friendliness and his generosity towards his friends. And so the person who comes to him is an, an old acquaintance, slant line, question mark, friend. A woman who was a girl when her family lived above Brunetti's family. So this is 40 years ago, maybe 30, 40 years ago. Brunetti's Here's a, a piece of information to throw out at people who, who don't know the books or aren't familiar with the family story. Brunetti comes of a very poor family. His father was a soldier in the Second World War and was badly damaged psychically by having been a prisoner of war for some time. His mother was a very simple person. I think I, think I gave her four years of, of education, of formal education, which would be right for women of her of her epoch if they lived in the countryside. It happened to a neighbor of mine in the mountains when she was 10 years old, her family decided, so this would have been around the year uh, 1920, 30, 
to have her work in the fields. She couldn't go to school, although she was very bright. She had to leave school to go work in the fields. And so Brunetti's mother was in a similar situation. She was very bright, but she couldn't continue in school because she had to continue to work. She had to get a job and work, even though she was only 10 years old. So Brunetti thinks back to Elisabetta and his memory of her. And he remembers, yes, we lived there down in Castello. We had the ground floor, which is always an unpleasant, unpleasant place to live in Venice. It's where poor people live because they're, if Aqua Alta comes, they sleep with the sea. The, the water will come in and up, up to their beds if they're unlucky and if they're in a, a bad place. And Castello is a bad place to be because it's a low zone. He was living there with his parents and his brother and they were poor. But they were real poor, not, not um, imaginary poor, sort of glamorous poor that gets put into books. They were really poor people. And he remembers how Elisabetta's mother, who lived upstairs, would sometimes come and knock on the door and enter the Brunetti home with some act of charity. And the one he remembers was knock, knock, knock. And it was Signora, whatever her name was from upstairs, coming down, she's coming down with a big, an enormous pot of pasta fagioli that had in it um, beans and meat. It had pieces of sausage in it. And she comes in, they're, they're a wealthy family, because in Venice, this is quite common for people, people who are wealthy to live in the same building with people who are poor. And she, she came in and said, oh, oh, I'm such a fool. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just such a fool, Guido. You know that from your long exposure, blah, blah, blah. And then she says, yesterday, your mother gave me her recipe for pasta fagioli because I smelled it so much and I know how good it must be. But I'm, I'm so stupid. I'm such a bad cook. I made a mistake with the size. So I made it twice as big. I put in twice as many peas, um, beans as I should, and I chopped up more sausage than I could. I've got this enormous pot up there. So we are never going to eat it. Would your family help me get rid of this? Because I can't throw it away. It's, it's wrong to throw away food. And she goes, oh, no, 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 no. And Brunetti gets up and says, of course, Signora. But he obviously has he's realized what she's done because she often comes down with these mistakes. What she's doing is functioning as a rich person and giving food to a poor person, but saving the honor of the poor person. So Brunetti enters into the charade and allows her to go over to the stove and she puts the, the food down, the pot down on the stove and she says, oh, thank you so much, you saved me. It would be so embarrassing to do this, to say this again to my husband and my daughter, what I've done. Blah, blah, blah. So she leaves and goes back upstairs and Brunetti walks over to the pot. And he takes the, the lid, he remembers going over to the pot and taking off the lid and looking in and smelling this. He, he identifies the spices, he smells the rosemary, he smells the thyme. And he looks down and he sees the wheels of sausage lying on the top of the pot. And he realizes that that night, he will not be hungry after dinner. And yet all of this is, is stuck in. It's a, it's a passage of maybe two pages to show more about Brunetti's past and more about the woman who comes to him's mother's gratitude and grace by doing this. She doesn't want to shame the Brunettis because they're poor. It's, a, it's an exquisitely sensitive character who would do something like this. I used to teach creative writing, which I don't think can be taught, but anyway. And one thing I tried to suggest to people was, it's not enough to say that someone was generous and kind. You have to, if you're writing fiction, you have to show a way that the person behaved generos generously and kindly or else you're just mouthing things. And I think that this is a scene which does demonstrate this, this woman's otherworldly generosity. And, it, and the, it tells a lot about Brunetti too, 
that he is sensitive to her charade, but he's glad that they can all get out of it with their honor intact. The hunger is gonna go away, but the family's honor has been preserved by the woman's grace. So he goes back into the present and he realizes that this woman is the daughter of the woman who was so good to his mother. And so, although he's a policeman and he shouldn't be doing these off the books investigations or these off the, off the books jobs, he cannot resist what he sees as the obligation to this family. And Elisabetta, who is now in her 60s, is still covered by that protective idea that Brunetti has. And so he says, of course, of course. And he feels thus obligated to take on the investigation because the investigation deals with a charity that is involved in, uh, where is it, in Belize. The, the organization has been set up and it's completely legitimate. And the money, the money goes to Belize every month, what they, what they collect. But Elizabeth is, is a little bit nervous about, there's just something about it that she, she finds strange and, and her husband behaves strangely when she talks about the foundation, about the charity. And so Brunetti is already assuming or, or um, ingesting information about the charity. And as the book continues, he becomes more and more involved and finds more and more evidence that something, something is, is strange. At the same time that this was happening, and there, there is a connection, and I, will, I hope that I will manage to make the connection clear. A friend of mine who is in her, in her 80s, she must be 84 by now, but completely healthy, a big, robust woman who was still working um, as a, a dealer in, in uh, precious objects. She went to Vienna. This was at the very beginning of COVID and got sick and was taken into the hospital in Austria, unconscious, heavy fever, sick, <laughs> really desperately sick as people were before the vaccine. And her friend, her Austrian friend with her because Emanuela doesn't speak German or doesn't speak much German. And she was lying there being admitted to the hospital and the friend had to write, fill out the form fill out the documents with the name, the address, the citizenship, the age, the this, the that. And she got to occupation. And she had known, she had known Emanuela all of her life. And she knew that she was Emanuela Noto Bartolo Disquera. But she also knew that she was Emanuela Principessa. So she wrote Principessa down as her occupation. And of course, the, the Austrians are in love with royal family, with noble families. So let alone a royal family, let alone a princess. So her, her treatment in the hospital, private room, private room, nurses running in and out all of the time. I heard this story when I went to see Emanuela after she had come back from her experience in Austria, completely beautifully cared for, completely restored to health and returned to Venice, she invited some people for lunch to celebrate coming home and being health, healthy. It was the first time I'd been to her apartment. So I went and went up and as I walked in the door, I saw photographs on a, on a, a bureau. They were silver framed, photographs about a foot and a half high, or a foot wide, maybe, maybe larger. And in all of them, there was a series of very distinguished looking men with, with beards, so, some of them with beards, wearing or holding under their arm pith helmets, the white pith helmets that the guys in the jungle used to wear, and wearing white, military uniforms. So they were in the Navy. 
because the Navy always wears the dress uniform in white. And all of them had bars and bars and bars of medals on the chest. And I said, as one would, Manuela, who are these? Who are these people? And she said, that's my great grandfather. That's my grandfather. That's my, no, no, no. Those are their friends. I said, and then the, there was a short guy in front of them wearing a military uniform. And I knew, I knew who he was, but it didn't come to me who he was. And I said, who's that? And she said, ah, yes, that's the king. So these were her relatives who had been admirals in the Italian Navy during the Second World War. Does that work? Or maybe it was the First World War. Anyway, one of, one of the wars. No, it, enough time has, has passed. It was the Second World War. They were the admirals who, who led the, the Navy. And this was the king. And they were just there on the piano. They weren't there because they were, I don't want to say famous. They were there because they were her relatives. Because in the same line, there were pictures of other relatives lying on the grass somewhere or um, sitting at a table having dinner. There, there was no distinction between or among these various social classes. But I was fascinated by the uniform and by, by the aesthetic beauty of the uniform and the pith helmet and the handsomeness of these guys, not the king, that I thought, this has got to go in the book. This has got to go into this book. And I, I thought for a long time how to do it until I, I realized that rather than trying to bring these people to life, I would just use their photos. And so there's a scene in the book where Brunetti goes to the home of a character, another character, and sees this line of military officers with the pith helmet and the white, the white jackets. And I, I make a big deal out of this only to show the way at least in my writer's mind, the material comes. I never know when something will just go zap. And I will know instinctively, well, after 30 years, it's not, it's, I suppose it still is instinct. After 30 times doing this, I, I trust my sensibility and my sense sufficiently to say, yeah, that's going in the book I'm working on. And since, Writing fiction is different from writing nonfiction, although I think there's a lot of nonfiction being written in lots of countries. It's really pretty much fiction. But anyway, in normal fiction, things are malleable, whereas in nonfiction, you can't change the dates and you can't change the, people, the names of the people who did things. And you can't say that an, an election was lost when it was won. At any rate, with fiction, you can, you can change things. And so all you need is something that, that goes wham to you as a writer, and then you're free to change it any way you want. You get told a story about someone and it finishes well. He marries, he marries the, the heiress and goes off to live in somewhere. You can change that. One is not obliged to to repeat a story the way it's told, which is very, very, I think it's very, very liberating for a writer because it allows us to neaten things up because life is a mess. Our lives are messy. And what fiction very often does is try to straighten things out and, and make our decisions and our lives seem not so random and chaotic. I'm of the mind that our lives are random and chaotic because of decisions that we make. In a novel, most characters have lives that proceed with some sense of, of certainty or uh, re reasonableness. Whereas other characters, usually the, the main characters have lives that are, are more unique. But I think in most 
there's there's the ground base of um, normalcy, whatever that is, of normal life. I the the other thing that this this did at the beginning of the book was to put Brunetti into a sort of nervous place because he's doing something that is not part of his profession. He's not on an official investigation because there's no there's no talk of crime. You can't, as a policeman, if someone comes and says, I have a sort of spooky feeling about that. You, you can't go in and, and fill out a form and say, reason, spooky feeling, because that, that's not a crime. And so Brunetti, all through this investigation, is always conscious of the fact that, yet once again, he has become a friend's private eye, in a certain sense. He's following, he's following a trail out of suspicion and friendship, not because he's doing his job as a police officer. So this makes him feel that he's in, a, in an awkward situation through most of the book, as indeed he is. I looked through the book today and I, I found this. I haven't looked at it for, I guess a year since I gave it in for publication. He's talking about Griffoni, his, his assistant, not his assistant, his fellow, his colleague as other, she's the other commissary, one of the other commissary. And he says, oh, the, I'm sorry, the narrator says, Brunetti was sure she had gone to Catholic schools, speaking of um, Griffoni, who has just lied to someone. And then the narrator, narrator goes on to say, it was only there, Catholic schools, that children mastered the alchemo, alchemical formula of untruth and hypocrisy that was sure to persuade even the most skeptical listener. I thought, oh yes. I, in every book I try to take a whack at organized something, either politicians or, or religion. The book goes on and he becomes more and more interested in what he finds. There is a scene in, in a veterinarian. There is also, I realize, I have to confess that these books, most of them are divided into in what in operatic terms would be called arias and recitativo. And these are terms from opera. When there are two or three characters in an opera who are singing about what's going to happen, one will say, ah, but you went to Salamanca and you didn't tell me and I saw you, I saw you there with another woman, you have betrayed me. Not singing, but sort of talking musically with the company, the company orchestra. And they discuss something and you learn something that has happened. You get new information about what has happened in the opera, what the characters have been doing. And then at a certain point, one of the characters says, aha, and then sings an aria. And in the aria, nothing happens. The aria is a reflection upon what has been happening. So that would have the hero or the tenor saying, she is the great love of my life. And he sings, oh, di quella pira, or any of those dolce mani. He, he takes a small idea and sings about it for five or six minutes, repeating again and again the same words. In the Brunetti books, there are scenes of recitativo and aria. And I didn't realize this until some years ago when I was thinking about this. And it came to me that that's true of the books. The recitativo are the parts where things happen, where people come in and have conversations and say, yes, but the money that was supposed to be sent there instead is sent there. Yes, but in the last year, he bought a new house and has been on many, many expensive vacations. This is new information. So people talk about it. But then there might be an aria and the aria would be 
Brunetti's memory of the pasta fagioli, where he thinks about what happened in the past. He's not, he's not alone because Elizabeth is there, but he's, in, he's alone because he's in his head. He's thinking about the past, reflecting upon something that happened in that, the past, talking about it again, as you know, he has spoken of it before, and very little happens. The woman comes in, puts the pot on the stove and leaves, but it takes a couple of pages to explain that. And I, I believe that the Brunetti books are divided up into these two forms. And I, I haven't applied it to other books. I, I think it would be easiest to, to apply it to crime books, to see how, how the information is given to the reader. That's the business. New information is the business of the characters in the book, to give new information to the reader. But these, these uh, arias serve as, I think, to tell the reader more about the inner workings of the character. You can learn a lot, you the reader, I the writer, we can learn a lot about Brunetti by what he does, how he behaves with other people. But luckily in a novel, there is the narrative voice where the narrator gets a chance to say, ah, this is something else that happened to him, but it happened to him 15 years ago. And this is what he thought, and this is what he felt. And I think that the fiction, all fiction needs both. Uh, standard fiction, that is, and, and most crime books use this, this, I don't want to call it a formula, but it is a kind of formula use this, this technique of doing what the business of the book is, which is to give information to the reader. So that at the end of the book, when all is revealed and the reader is finally allowed to see, to understand who the bad guy is or the bad woman is, it's been prepared for either by reflections in the mind of the detective or the police person, or by conversation interplay between the characters. And I, I believe that most crime books make use of both techniques. And I realize only in the, the few times that I reflect on these books after having written them, that I do the same thing. The one other thing, there are, there are many, you're going to hear a lot of one, one other thing, when I start a book, I don't have a clue. And so it's great, fun, it's great fun for me to have a reader come and say, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I knew it was going to be the something. And I, because my mother raised me to be polite in every circumstance, I say, wow, clever you. And what I don't say is, no, I hadn't thought of it at that time in the book when, when the person appeared. I don't know. I really don't know who is going to be the, the villain or the villainess. And I don't know what is going to happen. And so I start writing like, like a blind person fumbling around in a, in a room trying to find out what's here and what's there. My hand touches this and asks, ah, that must be the window. Maybe I could get out through the window. Ah, there's the door. Yeah. Oh no, it's the, it's the door to the kitchen. Now, let me do, ah, here's another door. Because I don't know what the, I usually don't know what the book is really going to be about. And I certainly have no idea. I have never, I, I have never, I think in all of these 31 books, known when I started the book, how the book was going to end. Sometimes I know what the book is, is going to be about. I think the reason for this is that I get, I get, um, I forget the word, hit in the, hit in the face. There's, a, there's a, a phrase that's used in crime books all the time for being absolutely surprised by what happens. Very often, the idea for a book comes to me, as I explained with, with, the, uh, with my friend who told me about the charity, comes to me that way. 
in that case, I, I sort of knew that this idea of this kind of corruption would be an interesting subject to write about. But sometimes it, it just whams me. I've, I've spoken about this before. I, I apologize if, if you've heard this before, but I, it's the best example I can find to give from, from my books. Years ago, I was at the opera in Zurich. And as I was leaving, there was a, a woman. I was with a friend. In front of me was a woman with extraordinarily beautiful clothing. She had beautiful shoes and she had a beautiful coat that looked like it was made out of, I don't know, ground up, ultra super cashmere. She was walking in front of me and I was curious about who would have such exquisite taste. And so as I, as I got to the staircase going down and out of the theater, she paused over here. So I paused next to my friend and I said, wait a minute. And I went, Zach, Zach, one second, two seconds. And saw a woman who in, in the book about face, which I wrote, was referred to, I believe by one of the characters as the super liftata. In fact, I think the character herself says, yes, I'm, I know I'm known as la super liftata. Una liftata is one who has had many liftings. Un lifting, that's a word that has slipped into Italian. Un lifting. A super, una liftata is one who has had either good or bad, but has had one surgery. E una liftata. But when the woman's face has got those sort of cat eyes that are, are sunken deep in the head and are, are turned at an angle, Italians will refer to una super liftata. And this woman was a super liftata. But the odd thing was that her other appearance, the way she walked and the way she moved and the style in which she was dressed suggested that she wasn't old enough to have had enough time to have that many lips. She might've been in her, I don't know, her thirties, maybe in her early forties, but no more than that. And I thought, well, okay, some of the best surgeons in the world are here in, in Zurich, but that's really, that, that's really, an extraordinary amount of work that has been invested in that face. And I went, I, I, and you can't see it flicking. The light bulb went off on my head and I thought, wow, why did that happen? And, and maybe this is what, I don't want to use the word inspired because that's nonsense. What gives me the idea for a book is this conflict of a secure interpretation of an event. Because the, the secure interpretation of having seen this woman behind from behind was that she was a young woman beautifully dressed and, and, and agile and, and young because she moved like a young person. And then the weirdness comes from seeing the face that usually would belong to a much older woman so that the lines didn't, didn't cross anywhere. There, there was an anomaly to be figured out. And I realized that other times that a single event has, has caused me to realize that there was a book. It, it could be, it can be the most minimal thing. It can be, it can be a sentence. One time I was on the street in Venice, I was chatting with, a friend, with friends. And a friend of theirs came along and started complaining about the, the decline in her neighborhood and the quality of people in her neighborhood. And then she said, yeah, and there's, there's a lot of drug selling. And then she said, this is the way the drugs are sold. And she explained the process, the physical process of giving the money and getting the drugs. First, the drugs getting to the 
to the, the wholesaler bringing to the retailer the drugs. And then the, the client's coming to get the drugs and taking them away. She explained it in a single sentence and the light went off again. And I said, okay, now I have the way it's done, but who is going to do it? And why are they going to do it? And what's going to happen because it's done? And this is, this is the way it works, at least with me as a writer. I, I don't sit or lie around and say, now, what's going on that I can write about? Usually I wait to hear the whistle and then, then I'm off. And up until now, it has worked, at least in terms of giving me a subject to write about, it has worked effectively and it has worked sufficiently for me to get, get boosted into a book. Uh, the first question that came in very early is simply, why did you decide to leave Venice? Okay, the answer is real easy. I'll give you two numbers, okay? The first number is 50,000, five zero, 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 zero. And then the other is 30 million. That's 30, zero, 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 zero. In the city of Venice, there are 50,000 residents. And in the years before COVID, there were 30 million tourists. Oh. Okay, every year, every year. And so I'm a relatively peaceful person and I'm, I'm a relatively calm person. I, I realized that when I would leave my house to go to the market or to go for a walk, I would, be, I would be stepping into a river of moving traffic, but, but it, was, it was confusion. Nobody kept to the right, which even on, on uh, Fifth Avenue or, or, or Lexington, you realize that this is, this is protocol. You go to the right and you go. And I would get to where I was going, whether it was the, the Beale vegetable stand or the Rialto market, and I'd already be angry, not, not, at, not at anyone, because no, nobody wanted to do me any harm. Just being in this mass of move, slowly, slowly moving people, because they were doing what tourists do, stopping to look at things. It's what I do when I'm a tourist. But I wanted to get to the store and get the avocados. And it, it became unsustainable because I was not, I was not at peace. So I just said, that's it, that's it. I have my Venetian friends, I, they, have, they don't have the option of leaving because they have their families and their lives and their work is there. But my work is portable. I go back, I go back for a week a month. I'm going, I go to London and then I, then I go to Venice for a week because it isn't crowded yet. But between May, May, June, July, August, September, I don't want to do that. Be because of what it does to me. The tourists are perfectly welcome and invited to, to do what they do. But it, since I went first to Venice in 68, I have a 50 year memory span of what the city was like. And up until the, the 80s, maybe the 90s, it was still a quiet place. And it's not, and I don't know, I don't, I, I can't be there anymore. So now I live in a Swiss village with 300 people and 300 cows. It's very, very nice. Sounds amazing. Um, okay. Why have you not allowed your books to be translated into Italian? Because I think that I would get a lot of grief from Italians who didn't read the books, but who read that an American, a non-Italian, it doesn't matter what my, nation, my nationality would be, that they wrote crime books in which Italian corruption, Italian weakness, Italian dishonesty was presented. I've had two people express that opinion to me, neither of whom had read the books, but they had read articles in the newspapers about this American who wrote about this and wrote about that. And I simply don't want that. I, I, I don't want that, that uh, I don't want a bad rap. None of my Italian friends, none of my Venetian friends has said, even suggested such an idea. In fact, they say, it's obvious how much affection I have for the place and for the people. And they've never read anything that offends them. 
I just don't want, I just don't want a, a, a false accusation. Do you have a favorite character other than Brunetti um, who appears in many of your books? Yeah, and my choice is perverse. Uh, I like, I, I adore Signorina Elettra and I like Griffoni more and more, but I love Papa. As a writer, I love Papa because he is so unpredictable. And what I have succeeded in doing with Pata is make him the villain with the, with the black mustache and the whip and the cowboy hat. And yet there is no indication that he is dishonest. There's no indication that he's disruptive or that he is dishonest. He's not in the fist of the mafia. He adores his two sons, one more foolish than the other, one more stupid than the other. And he adores his wife who has betrayed him. And so what I have managed to do is use everybody's boss, because most of us work for Pata at some time in our life. And many of our, many people, many of you are still working for Pata. He just, does, he just gets up your nose because he's so lazy. He's always grabbing the success in the manner of bosses. So I would feel very, very lost without Pata. Will there be any future books like Jewels of Paradise? Oh, bless the person who asked it. <laughs> did, they, did they like it? Tell that, please, question answer. Question okay. answer. Please write in whether you like the book, you didn't like the book. Okay, Jewels Fern. We're waiting for you, Fern, to yeah, tell us. Did you sure. like the book? Come All on, right. Fern. <laughs> I want an answer. Jewels but of Paradise. Think, Fern says she loved the book. Ah, okay. For those who haven't read it, Jewels of Paradise is a book that I was asked to write by Cecilia Bartoli, the singer. She said once, Donna, would you write something for my Salieri disc? It was a disc that she was going to issue that year of Arias by Salieri, who's another composer. And I said, sure, Cecilia, anything to help. What do you want me to say? She said, un fiction, not one fiction, un fiction, because we were speaking Italian. I said, Cecilia, un fiction, è un libro, it's a book. And she said, oh, I'm not poor. So I agreed to write a novel to go with her disc that was going to come out of the, the Arias by Antonio Salieri. And so I had to have a book about music. And who better, a musicologist. So I invented a musicologist and I invented a kind of mystery, not a murder, but a mystery, and, and wrote a non-Brunetti book and had glorious fun writing it. And this is my great temptation. I want, I think at the end of the book, um, I don't even remember her name, Christina, maybe? Pellegrini, Christina, something Pellegrini, Caterina Pellegrini. She goes off to St. Petersburg. She goes to Russia to work as an artist, to, as, to work as a musicologist in, in a, uh, an institution in, in Moscow. I am so tempted and have been for years to pick her up and take her out of Russia and send her to Naples and set a book with opera and set in Naples. But I don't have the time because I'm busy all, all the time. I help organize a, an, an opera orchestra and that takes up an enormous amount of my time. But that's my secret dream, to take Signor Dottoressa Pellegrini to, to Napoli. But I'd have to go and live in Naples for a couple of months and that would be great too. So thank you for the question. Okay. Um, what is the title of this first book in which you write about the origins of Brunetti and his family? I think it's in the first book, um, Death at La Fenice, where it is explained that he met his wife when he was a university student. They bumped into one another in the library and he fell in love, just gaga in love. He was blitzed. And the, the marriage is, as far as I can tell, is very successful and very happy. But it, it's sprinkled in, in all of the books. It's evident that he's a, he's a happily married man. Do you write every day? Do you have any advice for how to schedule writing time? 
No, I don't. Um, I, I, and I, I won't lie because I could say, well, of course, the best thing to do is to sit down. No, because I don't want to, I think it's a very subjective thing. I work best, I realize now, in, in maybe at, in the afternoon, maybe starting from three until seven or eight. But sometimes I get an idea in the morning and I, and I work in the morning. I have to, I have never just sat there. If it doesn't come, I leave. If it doesn't come, I don't try to force it. But usually what I do do is leave. I, I never stop writing at the end of a chapter. If I finish a chapter at six o'clock, even if I've been at it since the morning, I will start the next chapter and have two or three sentences so that the next morning I have a running start for where to go. That's the only sensible advice I can give. It works for me. It doesn't mean everybody's different. A, a friend of mine who writes crime, who has written a couple of crime books, came to me once and showed me the list, the list of chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, chapter six. She knew everything that happened in every chapter. And it's, oh my God, if only, if only I could do that because I just don't know. I don't know until I write it. it and it works. So I'm not gonna mess with it because it works. I don't know how it works or why it works or how long it will continue to work. So I just, I just leave it there and step over it and sit down at the computer and, and it's still working. It's definitely still working. Um, what was it like to write Bernetti's cookbook with your friend, Roberta? Well, in a way it became very boring because Roberta who was a jeweler. She's a jeweler, so absolute precision and cutting stones and putting stones in that. And I'm sort of a casinista who I always make casino, I always make a mess. She, the example I have given in the past is risotto di zucca, risotto with pumpkin. She was writing a book. I was invited to dinner with her and her husband. We, I went to their house and Biba served risotto di zucca. We all ate it. This was Monday. And we discussed the risotto di zucca. And Franco would say, no, I think it needs a little, no, you need more butter. You need more butter. Ah. Tuesday, the three of us at the table, risotto di zucca with more butter. Okay. And then the discussion, no, it needs more parmigiano. You use, you use the wrong kind of rice. Wednesday, Eva and Franco and Juliana. For a week, I ate risotto di zucca. And that happened with everything. Because you can't just make a recipe and say, no, 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 and go to the next page. You have to eat it. And you have to eat it within a time that you remember the last one. And so there was a certain amount of fullness in my life during the period. Luckily, sometimes I'd go away and Biba and Franco would take over on their own. And they'd sit for five days of the, or for three days of the week. It, writing the cookbook took them a lot of time to get them right. I didn't partake in all of that because I just had to write the five introductory pieces of Italian, Italian attitudes towards food. Since both of my grandmothers were Irish, you can imagine the kind of food I was used to when I grew up with. Oh, I shudder. Uh, are you sure that you will finish a book when you start it? Have you ever given up? Mm. I've never given up. No, there's, reason, there's no reason to give up because you don't like it, you change it. I, I have once written maybe two thirds of a book and realized that I took, I took the wrong road. So I just went back a hundred pages and changed everything. And, and from being a book that went that way, it became a book that went that way. 
but no, I, I've I've never I've never thrown it away. And I think I think part of that is because there is the mixture between aria and recitativo, and I can keep all of the family bits. So in a sense, half of what ordinarily would be thrown away if you decide to change a book completely can stay because it, it doesn't advance the plot in any way. But no, I've never, thank God. Um, I love Bernetti's wife and watching the children grow up. Did you have an inspiration for Paola? No, not really. Uh, she's, she's a, 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 I imagine she's an amalgam of people I've known, academics I have known. Um, she has qualities that I like that I don't. She's she's a terrible, terrible show off. She she always has to, and she shows off what she's read, as academics do. Having been one, I know. What was your inspiration for Electra? Ah, a friend of mine in Venice has a sister whose name is not Electra. And she told me once the story of, this is 30 years ago, more, 35 years ago. Her sister was working in a bank, was secretary to the director of the bank. This was at the time when the UN declared an embargo on South Africa. Europe was to have no dealings with South Africa, nothing, zero. So she went into work one day and the, doc, the um, director of the bank said, uh, I'd like you to take a letter to the president of the bank of Sadara in Johannesburg. And she put her pencil down and said, I'm sorry, dear Tony, I can't do that. I said, I, I asked you to do it. Why can't you do it? She said, well, there's an embargo against South Africa. We can't have any communication with them. We can't contact them because we were, signorina, but this is important because it's about, she said, I'm sorry, sir, I can't do it. I am, I am observing the UN's uh, sanctions. And before he could say anything, she said, Senor, just sit down, stay in your place. I will go out and take a walk around the block and come back. I'll have a coffee and I'll come back and then we'll get on with something else. So she got up, walked out, walked around the block, the block had a coffee and came back and said, now what shall we do? And he, he caved. He said, yeah, okay. And they did something else. She risked her job in defense of UN sanctions. There is someone I want as a character in the book. And I needed someone to use the computer because I'm hopeless. I couldn't find an eighth, a tenth, a smidgen of what she finds. Um, food and family are so central to each book. Brunetti never misses a chance to have a coffee or to come home for lunch. How do you orchestrate food and family to amplify and give texture to your stories or to regulate the action? I don't. I, it just occurs to me, he's going home for lunch. So he will have lunch with his family and they will talk about things. Or he's having dinner. He gets home eight o'clock and they've waited dinner or nine o'clock and they've waited dinner. Or Paula's fed the kids. And usually the meals are used not so much to describe the food, because the, the food, if, if you look carefully at the novels, the food is named and it isn't described a lot. There's not a lot of food porn in these books of the, the, the luscious <coughs> this or the luscious that. It, the meal is a place where he is back to the base. He's back to the, the cause of his sanity, or the protection of his sanity, where no one's angry, no one's killing anybody else. It's a place where he is restored both physically, but also spiritually by the contact with the people that he loves. And so they, they, serve, they serve a lot of, a lot of purposes because he can talk about what he's currently investigating with Paula or he can just talk about stuff. He can talk about books with the kids. I think in this book, he has a, a conversation with his daughter about his favorite hero. Yeah, she's been asked to, to name her favorite heroine and she asks him who is his. So they talk about the Oresteia. And he says, my favorite, my favorite female character is Clytemnestra. And, and Chiara says, but she's a killer. And he says, yeah, but I, 
I admire her. I admire her single purpose, her singleness of purpose. And they, they have an, inter to me, interesting conversation about literature. I never know what the, what the meal is going to bring. I never know what they're going to eat. I have to call Eva and say, Eva, it's, uh, I, I checked the text. I say, it's, it's March or it's November. What would they eat for lunch? And, mm -hmm. ah, and she tells me. Since current events play a role in all of your books, um, the characters need to keep up with them and reflect them in speech and action. Mm -hmm. How is the pandemic um, affecting your work? It's not, because I decided early on that sooner or later it would taper off. And I'm always projecting a couple of years ahead. The books are going to come out two years after I've written them. So I have to think in that world. And I, I thought that at a certain point, there would be the memory of COVID. People would no longer shake hands or people would be struck by how strange it was when someone offered their hand to shake or to think about not having to wear the mask. Also, we don't know where this is going. It looks... It, so I, I don't know. And so I didn't want to risk being dead wrong about the situation of COVID. But people will always, for years, we will be the people waiting for the aftershock of the volcano. And we're, we're never, ever going to be really confident again about the general health of the population. And that's what I try to insert and to inject into the, into the books. And not go on and on. Oh well, because everybody's had enough of that. Interesting. Um, what drew you to crime fiction as a genre? When I was in graduate school, writing my dissertation on the changing moral order in the universe of Jane Austen's novels, and teaching as a teaching assistant at the University of Massachusetts, and teaching. Dryden and Spencer and Pope and explaining things to students. When I went home at night, I didn't want to read Jane Austen. I wanted to read something that was, and I didn't have a television, so I read murder mysteries. So when I was in grad school, I read a lot of murder mysteries. And I realized unconsciously, because it never occurred to me that I was going to write one, I absorbed the rhythm, the rhythm and the pattern and the formula. And so when I got the idea to write a book, I thought, oh yeah, well, I, I, know, I know the formula, but all I have to do is, is fill it up a different way. And that's, that's what I proceeded to do because the formula is really pretty easy. Okay. We are sadly out of time. I'm just gonna ask one last question and um, I'd like to return to something we were talking about backstage, as it were, um, being as we are probably surrounded by book lovers. Uh, what has it felt like for you to not be able to, vis to visit English language bookstores? And um, what are you looking forward to? On Saturday, no, Monday, Monday, sorry. Monday, I go to London and I have a free evening. That means I can go to my hotel, Durrance, and around the corner is Daunt's Bookstore on Marylebone High Street, where I have been a client for the last 30 years. I am going to immerse myself in books, the ability to see rooms of English books and have the possibility to buy them not online from Amazon. I will go into a bookstore and I will put money down on the counter and I will take more money from my pocket and I will open my bag and throw more money on the counter and go crazy buying books because I haven't, well, I haven't been in an English language bookstore since I was in Toronto in March of 2000. And I cannot wake, I feel like a drug addict who has been deprived of his or her dose of whatever it is for two years. I cannot wait. Thank you so much for spending this time with us.
It's fun. It, it always really is. Appreciate it. It really always is. Next time, I hope we're hosting you in person. And thank you so thank very you. much for all of You're your work. You're more than welcome. And I, I thank, I thank the, um, the listeners for their patience. <laughs>